Good evening, everyone. We want to welcome you back again to the Senate House Museum for our lecture series, The Kingston's Buried Treasures. Uh, tonight is our 14th lecture in our series, and the subject tonight is Christopher, or uh, more commonly known, Kit Davids, who is really one of the most interesting characters in early Kingston, as well as the early roundout. Uh, and I believe we're also going to learn a bit about the first two, uh, two wars here. So in the, wars, yeah. yep. So we are very, very fortunate tonight to have as our, uh, as our presenter, Mark Freed. And feel free to applaud. <laughs> We, we really, we are very, very blessed tonight to have Mark here because Mark is really the authority on early Kingston and our early settlers. Uh, in fact, he has written the book, I'm sure many people have read it, this is the book, The Early History of Kingston and Ulster County. This is the, the really the authority on early Kingston and our settlers. Bible. Bible. The, the Bible. <laughs> this is the Bible on early Kingston. Um, it, it truly is. I, I read this book uh, probably every two years. Uh, and it really, uh, again, it truly is the Bible. So we're very, very fortunate. Uh, Mark has written a number of books, including uh, Tales from the Schwangunk Mountains, A, Natu a Naturalist Musings, A Bushwhacker's Guide, uh, The Huckleberry Pickers, A Raucous History of the Schwangunk Mountains, uh, Schwangunk Place Name, Dutch and English Region, Their Origins, Interpretation. It's actually pronounced Shangam. Okay, I know I heard a little, a little whistling. I uh, used to work in the district attorney's office. I was a prosecutor in the town of Shangam. Being from New Paltz, I didn't understand that it was Shangam, and I would say Shwangam. I was there for 14 years. The judge there corrected me each and every time. So <laughs> I do have it now. So again, uh, please welcome Mark Fried, our, our feature presenter. Thank you, Paul. If Christopher Davids <clears throat> were somehow to arise from the grave and look on, on these proceedings with the benefit of some familiarity with the 300 years of history that separate his world from ours, he would probably shake his head in disbelief and say to himself, how in the heck did little old me ever get included among such notables as John Vanderlyn, Sojourner Truth, General Sharp, Judge Parker, and the eminently respectable Thomas Chambers, Lord of the Manor of Foxhall. He might even roll his eyes and paraphrase Marx before turning and exiting the room by telling us that any lecture series that would include the likes of me, I wouldn't want to be a part of. <laughs> We have here one of the conundrums of history and indeed of human nature. We are fascinated not merely by the great personages, the influential leaders, but also and sometimes more so by the quirky, the unconventional, the puzzling, the unsavory character who has managed to stir our passions or stimulate our imagination. Kit Davis was all these things. And it seems that just as we get on the verge of assembling enough evidence to make him into a little bit of a nonconformist hero, some more evidence jumps in to show us his slightly sleazy side, his fallibility even in the role of nonconformist hero. Davis was born in England in 1616 or late 1615. In 1638, his name first appears in the manuscripts of the colony of Rensselaerswick. But a more substantive entry is to be found in the Rensselaerswick Court Minutes of March 3rd, 1650. On that date, an action was brought against Davids for allegedly hitting Rake Rutgers on the head with a post, beating his servant black and blue, and wounding Jan Dirksen from Bremen by striking him on the head with a tankard. Thus does Kit Davids make his debut in the documentary records of New Netherland. As all or most of you know, the story of Kingston's settlement begins with Thomas Chambers' deed from the Esopus Indians dated June 5, 1652. Actual settlement occurred no later than the spring of 53. The place was known as Esopus, and when a court was established here in 1661, the name Wiltwick was bestowed. 
The name Kingston doesn't appear until several years after England took the province of New Netherland from the Dutch and began anglicizing geographical nomenclature. All the earliest settlers bought land from the Indians along the fertile agricultural flats of the Esopus Creek. All that is except Kit Davids. He settled down near the mouth of the Rondout where he lived with his wife Cornelia DeVos and where his two sons were presumably born. <coughs> Let's take a look now at the geography of the Esopus region and the peculiar economic and strategic relationship between these two riparian uh, loca localities, the Rondout and the Esopus. The Rondout comes down out of the Catskill Mountains uh, to the base of the Shangam Ridge and makes a sharp left turn and continues on to enter the Hudson just south of Kingston. Uh, the Wallkill lies southeast of the Shangam Ridge and flows into the Rondout just northeast of Rosendale. And of course, a major tributary of the Wallkill is the Shangam Kill right over here. Um, this was a natural route of travel. This Rondout Wallkill system was a natural route of travel for these Sopus Indians if they wanted to reach the Hudson River. Now, the Sopus Creek. Uh, comes down out of the Catskills, the way the Rondout does, almost parallel, running from northwest to southeast, and also makes a sharp left turn and parallels the Rondout, makes a close pass to the Rondout before suddenly changing its mind and uh, heading due north to enter the Hudson all the way up near Saugerties. Now, the, so the Sopus Creek had lots of good uh, farmland. Um, and, of course, there were Indians settled along it. Uh, but the Wallkill Roundup system also had good farmland, not during the, the final half dozen miles or so. Here, the Roundup lies in a ravine uh, and very little good farmland. But further up, around Napanok and Warsing uh, and Accor and Krahonkson, and also along the Wallkill from Rifton, just south of Rifton, all the way on up to almost to Gardner, uh, and along the Shangam Kill in this area, there was plenty of good agricultural land. Um, it was probably uh, security considerations that helped determine that the Sopus India's most important settlements would be well in the interior in the Wallkill Shangam, uh, uh, the Wallkill Rondout Valley system, uh, a little less accessible to the powerful Mohawks and a little closer to their Lenape brethren in the Minisink region along the Delaware and points south. Um, an interesting item from the Journal of New Netherland Trader and Patroon David de Vries gives us a, 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 a brief glimpse of the mouth of the Rondout Creek be, uh, prior to any European settlement. On April 27, 1640, uh, passing the mouth of the Rondout, de Vries recorded the following in his journal. We came to Esopus, where a creek runs in, and there the savages had much maize land, but all somewhat stony. On his return trip, uh, May 14th, he wrote, we reached Esopus, where a creek runs in, and where there is some maize land upon which some savages live. Now, settlement um, by the European colonists occurred, of course, not along the, uh, along the Rondout, but up along the Esopus, because it was an agricultural settlement over in this region, really, just present-day Kingston, or just north of present-day Kingston. Um, and um, the, the uh, settlers were invited by the Esopus Indians uh, who wanted the access to trade goods. Uh, now, from probably about 1614, there had been some intermittent trading at the mouth of the Rondad Creek, we can presume. There was no fort there, contrary to what some of the old history books say. Um, but uh, there were trading ships going up and down on the Hudson, and we could presume that there was a modest amount of trading, uh, occasional trading, of beaver pelts. Now, most of the beaver trade was in the Mohawk Valley, uh, the Iroquois bringing beaver pelts to 
uh, Fort Orange, uh, present-day Albany. And that vastly overshadowed what was going on down here. But this, again, was a natural route of travel. And so there was uh, just enough trade going on that the Esopus Indians started to get uh, be desirous of and become increasingly dependent on uh, manufactured trade goods. Um, when you think of what these trade goods, um, how they improved uh, convenience and efficiency amongst the Indians, uh, guns, which uh, enable the Indians to hunt, to shoot prey uh, game from a much greater distance than the bow and arrow. Uh, Stroudwater cloth, woven wool clo woolen cloth from the uh, Stroudwater Valley of England, which the Indians could fashion into blankets and clothing and garments much more efficiently, much more easily than, uh, you know, animal skins and furs. Uh, iron axes, um, copper kettles for boiling water and cooking, uh, you know, maize uh, and beans and so on and so forth. As far as we know, though, the Napa Indians had no um, clay vessels which could be used for heating water directly over a fire. Uh, if they wanted to uh, cook something, um, they made a big hole in the ground, lined it with an animal skin, put water in there, and over a separate fire, they heated rocks, which they would drop into the water to make it boil and simmer. Well, if you ever try to keep a nice, steady simmer going using this method, it cannot have been very convenient. So again, copper kettles were you know, a vast uh, convenience to these Sopus Indians. So from the occasional trading uh, between 1614 and the arrival of settlers in the mid part of the century, the Sopus Indians started to really develop a taste for these manufactured goods. They would trade beaver pelts and sometimes you know, venison or, or something of this sort. Now, once settlement was made along the Esopus Creek, um, now the Indians also had the option, in addition to bringing their, their beaver pelts or whatever they had to trade directly to the mouth of the Rondout to encounter the ships, they probably started using the overland footpath from the Rondout up to the Esopus to access the uh, settlers right in the settlement the Dutch settlement of Esopus. Uh, however, the, the uh, mouth of the Rondout now was the port for this Dutch settlement. Um, unlike most settlements, uh, Esopus did not grow up immediately behind or adjacent to a port, but it had a port nevertheless a couple of miles you know, uh, away. And um, manufactured goods, livestock, soldiers, uh, communications, all came into the mouth of the Rondout, and then went overland a couple of miles to the Esopus Dutch settlement. And of course, um, agricultural products, chiefly wheat, came down and were shipped out from the mouth of the Rondout. So with the increase in shipping traffic, uh, the Indians, uh, uh, you know, in addition to being able to go overland directly to the, to the settlement, the Indians still had great use for the traditional route to the mouth of the Rondout uh, because of the increased uh, traffic of ships there. And once Kit David settled here, they now had a middleman, someone who could speak the language of the Indian uh, and um, whom they could deal with uh, you know, in, in, as, a, as a middleman with this trading. That Kit David chose to settle alone with his family at this location speaks reams about who he was, about his economic and occupational aspirations, and his social tendencies. For here, a few miles from his nearest Euro-American neighbors, and despite occasional contact with, you know, the skippers and, 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 and uh, you know, on the sloops that came in and out, uh, he was often more in contact with Native Americans than, when, than with his fellow Christians. David's farmed at least a part of his 12 acres of somewhat stony land down along the Rondau. But from what is known of his personality and habits, and from his convenient location down there near the Strand, 
It seems more than likely that Davids must have engaged in many of the pursuits associated with the Indians, and through his own efforts, possibly doing some, some hunting or trapping, and primarily through dealings with the Indians, such as illegal liquor sales, uh, must have obtained beaver pelts and disposed of these on board the yachts that sailed into the mouth near of the Rondout Creek near his abode. Regarding Davidson's purchase of land down on the Rondout in 1653, the documentary record shows that Kit did not acquire this directly from the Indians. The document in question is from the Ulster County deed record and is dated January 25, 1723, but references Davidson's purchase of 70 years earlier. And the document re reads uh, in part as follows. Whereas Johannes Dykeman purchased from the Indian proprietors a certain parcel of land uh, upon the strand by the creek or kill containing about 12 acres or six morgan and was by the said Dykeman upon the 16th day of August in the year 1653 was transported and made over unto Christopher Davis who upon the 27th day of March 1667 sold his interest therein unto Everett Pels, etc., etc. So Davids was preceded by a land speculator, someone who bought land down there without ever intention of, of moving there himself, and then sold it to Davids. Um, okay, during the early years of the Esopus settlement, until 1661, Esopus had no local government of its own and lay within the jurisdiction of the court of Fort Orange and Beverwick, modern day Albany. These uh, court minutes of, of this court, uh, Fort Orange and Beverwick, contain some interesting references to Davids. And you will note a consistent thread running through these documents. Uh, and uh, you can determine what they say about Kit Davis's personality and how he was viewed by his fellow um, settlers. Um, on December 23rd, uh, 1653, the court interrogated one Lawrence Yunts, burger and inhabitant of Beverwick. And um, the, um, uh, Mr. Yunts was asked whether about four months ago he was not in the Esopus with Commissary Dykeman. Answers yes. Whether when there he did not understand and hear Christopher Davids say in the presence of the Commissary that he, Christopher, had sold to the savages at one time 22 muskins of brandy and afterwards also a half anchor of brandy? Answers, yes. Whether he did not understand and hear Marcellus, the servant of Mr. De Halter, say that he, Christopher Davids, now and then had sold not one but several anchors of brandy to the savages, which he, Marcellus, had noticed and seen while he lived there at the house of Christopher Davids. Answers yes, and that Christopher Davids himself said that the Sacamas of the savages themselves had been to see him, Kit Davids, and begged him not to sell any more brandy to the savages, as through it they got into serious fights with each other and made trouble. About a year later, in December of 1654, Johann de Halter exhibited to the court a letter from Director General Stuyvesant addressed to Christopher Davids and warning Davids as follows. You are to permit the heir to Halter and his to enjoy free possession of land purchase and other things and not incite the savages against him or his, nor let harm come to his property, nor do him the least injury. If you do so, we shall proceed against you according to law. Let this serve as a final warning to you according to which to regulate yourself that the aforesaid heir may enjoy free possession and in case you act to the contrary, we shall at once proceed against you according to law. The court forwarded a copy of this letter to Davids. Now, what was Kit Davids doing harassing De Halter, or the latter's laborers, along the Esopus Creek where De Halter's land lay? The only clue was that Kit Davids himself had invested in a neighboring tract there, which he sold to Jacob Jansen Stoll, uh, we believe, in 1656. 
So presumably he had some kind of boundary dispute with the halter or some kind of personal feud going on. <clears throat> Sometime before February 27, 1657, Davidson's wife died. For on that date, <clears throat> there appeared uh, before the court of uh, Fort Orange and Beverwick, Jan Fairbake and Everett Vendel, orphan masters of the court, who declared that seeing the bad management of Christopher Davids in administering the estate left undivided between himself and his children, the heirs of Cornelia DeVos's deceased wife. They had thought fit for the preservation of the said property and the protection of the children to nominate and propose the persons of Andres DeVos, the father of the said Cornelia DeVos, and Arendt Andreessen, uncle on his wife's part of the said children, as curators thereof, who, appearing before the court, have voluntarily agreed and promised upon oath to equip themselves therein to the best of their knowledge and to the best advantage of the estate and the children. Wherefore, the court have granted them authority as lawful curators of the said estate and guardians of the aforesaid children. On September 3rd, 1658, at an extraordinary session of the Fort Orange and Beverwick Court, Davids was accused of inciting the Indians against the Christian community. And there appeared the court officer as plaintiff, and Christopher Davis was there in person as a defendant. The plaintiff says that an affidavit from the Esopus has been handed to him, according to which the defendant, coming from the Manhattans in the yacht of Everett Pelse, and while being in the Highlands, said to two savages who came on board that the sachem to wit the honorable general, referring to Stuyvesant, had killed the savages at the Manhattans, and that the following night he would come to the Esopus and there also break the necks of the savages. Whereupon the savages of the Esopus took some Christian prisoners and committed great outrages. The honorable plaintiff therefore requests that the defendant be examined. Davis was asked whether in coming from the Manhattans and being in the Highlands he did not call out or say that the Dutch in the night of the 23rd of August had killed many savages at the Manhattans and that the following night they would come to the Esopus and break the necks of the savages there. Kit Davis answers no, but that he said to the savages who were on board, I know nothing about that. The defendant pleads not guilty and produces two affidavits, one from Hendrik van Dyck and the other from Dirk Janssen, skipper, who attests that while they were in the Highlands, two savages came on board who asked Christopher Davis whether the sachem would come and kill all the savages in the Esopus in the Highlands, whereupon Christopher Davis answered, I know nothing about it. The court was apparently unable to counter the defense's affidavits, and the matter seemed to have gone nowhere. We must keep in mind that the verbal exchange between Davis and the Indians might well have taken place at least partly in the Indian tongue. And so perhaps no one but Davids and the Indians really know what had been said, what had transpired. Although Kitt seems to have cleared himself of the charges, a year later, uh, Sergeant Andres Lawrenson, stationed at the Esopus, wrote to Stuyvesant that Kitt Davids continues in his old tricks of selling liquor to the Indians and tattling. So we see a consistent pattern of Davids getting into fights, having an argument with uh, Johann de Halter and inciting the Indians against him, uh, being a very poor administrator uh, of the uh, funds uh, left undivided between himself and his children by his deceased wife, uh, being accused uh, uh, of inciting the Indians. Uh, now, we, we, we probably should give Kit Davis the benefit of the doubt that you know, it would have served no purpose for him to Gratuitously, gratuitously incite the Indians, uh, you know, against the, uh, against the Christians. But uh, you know, clearly he was viewed with suspicion and distrust, and probably dislike uh, by a lot of the other, uh, you know, Dutch and English um, settlers. In September 1659. The Esopus became inflamed in serious hostilities that have come to be known as the First Esopus War. 
This began a transition in Kit David's life in which he was drawn more closely to the settler community and his linguistic and, and social intimacy with the Indians began to come into service more in connection with wartime negotiations rather than being devoted to trading and dealing on his own account. His intimacy with the Indians did not prevent his becoming victimized by them once hostilities broke out. In a letter to Director General Peter Stuyvesant on September 26, 1659, shortly after the start of this war, Vice Director Willem La Montagne advises not to allow any weak parties to land at the mouth of the Rondout, quote, for the savages are there with more than 400 well-armed men and have taken possession of Kit Davids's house where they keep a good watch and lookout. An interesting letter exists <clears throat> in which Davis petitions Director General Stuyvesant and the New Netherland Council regarding his property down near the Rondout. The petition is dated June 11, 1663, just four days after the sudden Indian attack and massacre that precipitated the Second Esopus War. But in this petition, Davis is clearly referring to the outbreak of the first war four years earlier. And this petition by Davis to Stuyvesant and the council reads as follows. This parcel of land, referring to his land down on the strand, had been inhabited and cultivated until the time when the savages began their war against the Christians. Then petitioners dwelling on the said land was burned by the savages and he was compelled to fly with wife and children to save their lives and to abandon everything. Since that time, he has very poorly subsisted himself and family on a sterile, scanty place in a bark house, and whereas petitioner cannot support it or provide for his family there, he requests permission to take again possession of the aforesaid piece of land. You can just hear the violins playing in the background here. Perhaps the sterile, scanty place where Kit and his family uh, resided during this time, uh, after having to flee from the Esopus, uh, may have been at Claverack um, in present-day Columbia County uh, on the other side of the river, where Davis is on record as having, with another farmer, leased a bowery for three years beginning October 1660. Um, his wife, Davis's wife, mentioned in this petition about having to flee with his wife and, and, and family. Uh, this was his second wife, uh, Maria Mertens. Now, Kit Davis is probably engaging in a lot of hyperbole in this letter. For instance, despite what he says about having to flee for his life, he seems to have been on a visit to Fort Orange at the time that this war out bro uh, broke out. For Vice Director La Montagne dispatched him from Fort Orange to Esopus with an Iroquois Indian to be ready for diplomatic service. And even the issue of the Indians burning his house is somewhat questionable, as we'll see later. Uh, in context of another document. During this four-year period, um, David seems, so now he has fled Esopus, uh, and, and during this period, David seems to have spent much of his time away from Esopus, farming in Claverack, conducting business in Beverwick. Um, he was down in Manhattan at, on at least one occasion. In May of 1662, he sold a parcel of land he owned in Catskill. A year later, we find him and his wife back at Esopus temporarily, uh, having their son Abraham baptized by Domini Bloom. In the summer of that year, 1663, Davis was frequently used by the Dutch as an interpreter, messenger, and informant during the Indian War. He thus seems to have drawn closer to the community undoubtedly because of the losses he suffered in the First Esopus War and its consequent financial circumstances. It is uncertain just how soon Davis and his family returned to the Strand and built the small dwelling mentioned in the subsequent land sale to Everett Pelse. This probably occurred in 16, late 1664 after the Indian War was over. On August 3rd, 1663, <clears throat> in the thick of the Second uh, Indian War, the Council of War at Esopus, presided over by the Dutch military commander, Captain Krager, resolved um, to summon by the first upbound yacht, uh, upward bound yacht, 
Christopher Davids from above, from Fort Orange, to come down to Esopus to serve us as a guide, for he is well acquainted with the localities of the Esopus savages, and without him, little or nothing could be accomplished. This is a remarkable endorsement that says a great deal about Kit Davids' newfound respectability, even indispensability, in the service of the Christian or Euro-American community. Later that same month, Krager writes in his journal as follows, and this is from his uh, August 19th entry. Uh, now remember, Krager was stationed with uh, soldiers at the Esopus. And he writes, um, about three o'clock in the afternoon, Christopher Davids came from the Manhattans in a canoe, brought with him a letter from the Herr General Stuyvesant, dated 14th of August, brought also a letter from Peter Kaubenhoven, who lay with his sloop in the Dunstkammer. Uh, Kaubenhoven was a lieutenant serving under the command of Captain Krager, and he, was, um, he commanded a contingent of Long Island Indians who were allied with the Dutch against the Esopus Indians. Christopher Davids informs us that he slept one night with the Indians in their wigwams. This is on his way up in a canoe from the Manhattans. That some Esopus Indians and Sachems were there who had four Christian captives with him, one of whom, a female captive, had secretly told him, Davids, that 40 Esopus Indians had already been near our fort to observe the reapers and the other people. And so the Council of War uh, summons the sheriff, who was given an order directing him to warn the inhabitants not to go from the fort, meaning the stockaded village, uptown Kingston, where we are right now, uh, not to go into the fields without a suitable escort. Christopher Davis also informed us that the Indians had on shore several bowls and gourds with brandy, which they obtained daily from the sloops, as the Indians had informed him they could get as much as they required and whatever powder and lead they wanted. So here we see Kit Davis being entrusted as a courier, bringing a letter from no less Director General Stuyvesant to his military commander, Captain Krager, at the Esopus, and bringing also a letter from the subordinate officer, Lieutenant Calvin Hoban. We see him providing intelligence uh, to uh, Captain Krager uh, that the Indians had been spying on the, uh, you know, the stockaded village here and, uh, and on the, the people going into the fields uh, you know, to work in the grain fields. Uh, intelligence which resulted in Captain Krager issuing an order that you know, these people should be accompanied by a guard. Um, and we even find, and we find him giving intelligence about the presence, you know, the whereabouts of several of the, uh, of the, of the captives, and even tattletailing on, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the skippers, uh, you know, uh, and, and others trading up and down the river uh, for, you know, providing the Indians with liquor and with powder during wartime. This is quite a reversal. Uh, you know, Kit Davids, was, if nothing, uh, if nothing else, he was an opportunist. Two months earlier, in a letter to Stuyvesant, uh, Counselor Johann de Decker writes a very puzzling letter. He says, some friends here, this is up at Fort Orange, some friends here had dispatched Christopher Davis to the Esopus savages on the 20th of June to learn and see whether he could not get Monsieur La Montagne's daughter and some other prisoners out of the hands of the barbarians. He took his way directly through the country and strayed from the right road at a kill about four leagues from, Win from Wiltwick inland, which would be about 12 miles. When the friends, hearing of his intention, advised against his proceeding further for peace, as they say that the rascals may keep him also, the Indians may take him captive also. He has consequently returned here yesterday without accomplishing anything, without having met a savage on the road. Now, this is something very puzzling about this letter. Some friends of uh, Counselor de Decker suggest uh, or dispatch Kit Davids to go on this mission alone uh, into the wilderness to negotiate with the Indians. Kit Davids does so, and then these same friends, I guess, have second thoughts and, and start to worry about him. 
Um, and Kip Davids turns around and comes back. Now, they didn't have cell phones in those days. So we can only assume that Kip Davids sort of independently arrived at the same conclusion. He was about 12 miles from Wiltwick. He realized he had taken a wrong turn and was lost. And he must have just said, you know, I better get the heck out of here and go back, you know, before I end up a prisoner as well. But, you know, the, the moxie of this guy during wartime to go, to allow himself to be, uh, you know, talked into just going on this uh, mission alone into the wilderness, uh, you definitely have to hand it to him. I don't think there's anyone else uh, at, at Wiltwick or uh, the, you know, refugees from the new village who would have dared do anything of that nature. There were two major expeditions by the Dutch against the Esopus Indians during the summer of 1663. The first was to the main settlement of the Esopus Indians, believed to have stood on Indian Hill at the edge of the present hamlet of Wawarsing at the confluence of, Vern of the Vernoy and Rondout Creeks. Um, now, the, uh, the soldiers undoubtedly followed the Esopus Creek, went overland, then upstream along the Rondout. They brought a cannon along, which was a huge encumbrance, um, you know, going over ravines and up and down hills. They ended up abandoning it. The Indians, uh, at their primary settlement, their council house uh, in, at Wawarsing, uh, well, no, this would be a little downstream, uh, over, you know, somewhere around here. Um, they got wind of his approach, and they decided not to make a stand in their fort. So they dispersed themselves into the woods and the hills with their white captives. Kreger arrives there. Uh, he was unsuccessful in engaging the Indians in battle or in rescuing any of the captives, but his army, which is well over 200 men, uh, spent a few days destroying the Indian village, cutting down over 200 acres of maize, uh, digging out and destroying over 100 pits of stored maize and beans, and finally, on the last day of the month, um, uh, you know, uh, setting fire to the wigwams and the uh, palisades and marching out, marching back to Wiltwick. This was a huge economic blow to the Esopus Indians. Um, the Indians then took their captive across the Shangam Ridge, we may assume that was certainly the most direct route, to another Indian village. Now, the Wawasing village had ancient Indian stockade as well as more modern, uh, uh, sturdier uh, stockades, um, enclosing the wigwam. The village on the Shangam, and it, was, it became known as the Old Fort of the Sopus Indians. The, uh, the village on the Shangam Kill, the east side of the Shangam Kill, was unfortified. Uh, the, uh, the Indians brought their captives there and started building a place of refuge. Uh, they didn't have the manpower or the time to surround the entire village, you know, all the wigwams with fortifications, but they were building a place of refuge from which to defend themselves in case of attack. Now, this Indian village, uh, again, on the east side of the Shangam Kill, three and a half miles northwest of the present hamlet of Wallkill, and incidentally, three miles nearly due west of my own house, which, however, was not yet standing at the time. <clears throat> uh, Kit Davis was along on this expedition as interpreter. That's a matter of record. Um, I, I think I'm finished with the map at this point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there we go. Uh, so uh, he leaves, uh, uh, you know, with his army, a much smaller army, a little more a leaner army, about 55 men. Uh, plus some volunteers and so on and so forth. Um, they arrive on September 5th uh, at the first, within sight of the first maize field associated with this Indian village. There, they are now on the east side of the Shangam Kill, same side as the fort, a couple of miles from the, from the fort and village. And they see the maize field across the kill. And what do they see? Two Indian women and a captive white woman harvesting maize in the field. Uh, so as not to be detected, they, he moves his army into the woods. 
they came, come to the Indian village itself about 2 o'clock in the afternoon and get very close before uh, an Indian woman sees them and starts you know, screaming and spreading the alarm. Uh, but they rush on, on the Indians who are busy constructing this, uh, this fort. The Indians had time only to grab a few bows and arrows and guns and, and run down the embankment and swim across the kill and return fire from the other side. Um, when, all, when, when, when the battle was over, Craigier counted 22 Indians lying dead uh, on the site. The Dutch lost three dead and six wounded. Now, because of the wounded, they could not spend a few days you know, destroying the fields and, and, and burning the wigwams and so on. They had to head directly back toward Wiltwick. Um, he does, Craiger does report that, meant that despite, besides these 22 dead, that many, probably many more were wounded. And some subsequent documents would indicate that the total Indian fatalities may have been approximately double of this count of 22. Now, during this expedition, Kit Davids himself and the Dutch soldiers and freemen got their first glimpse of the fertile and spacious valley of the Walkill and its major tributary, the Shangam Kill. And although their first thoughts were, you know, of a military nature, freeing the captives, returning, so on and so forth, um, it seems likely that the idea may have been planted in their mind, boy, what a beautiful, fertile, spacious valley to someday settle in. And of course, that happened um, really just uh, 73, 15 years later when Newpost was first settled. Besides the carnage, the plundering of the wigwams, and taking 13 Indian prisoners, the expedition was an unqualified success for the Dutch in that it resulted in the rescue of 23 white women and children who had been held captive by the Indians since their surprise attack of three months earlier. These captives were unharmed in report having been well treated and in fact had been living peacefully as wards of the Indians for this three month period. Now I mentioned that Craiger reported seeing a captive white woman with two Indian women harvesting maize. He also reported that they were well treated and, and, and you know, unharmed and so on and so forth. Um, and there's every reason to believe that uh, these women and children had been incorporated into the life of the Indian village, the women helping harvest, helping with cooking and other chores, the children undoubtedly playing together. And this would be consistent with the history of uh, the Lenape Indians because their population had suffered devastating losses. Uh, it's been estimated that between the year 1600 and 1700, the population of the Lenape Indians as a whole had been diminished by 90%, partly from war, but mostly from diseases, particularly smallpox, uh, that the Indians had had no chance to evolve uh, natural immunities to, unlike the Europeans and Mediterraneans who've been living with these diseases for a few thousand years or more, and a certain segment of the population had evolved, uh, you know, immunities. The Indians had no immunities, and they died in droves. And so any opportunity they had, even though here they probably understood that these captives were only temporary, temporarily with them, still they treated them well, they fed them well, uh, and, and incorporate them into village life. Now, much of this is logical uh, assumptions. You know, uh, the documentary evidence is, you know, sparing. But I did, uh, just about 10 years ago, come across a document uh, in connection with some other research, uh, quite serendipitously come across a document which helps confirm uh, this, uh, this logical assumption. And this is a, a uh, de deposition made in 1765 regarding a court case and as a very uh, incidental uh, to the main thrust of this deposition, uh, a statement is made by Cornelius Du Bois. Now, it's a matter of record that uh, Catherine Blanchon, 
the wife of Louis Du Bois, who later became one of the patentees of New Paul's. Catherine Blanchon and two of the Du Bois children, Abraham and Isaac, aged six and four, that these were among the captives taken in the Esopus massacre of June 7, 1663. Well, Abraham and Isaac had a younger brother, Solomon, who was born after the Indian War. And Solomon had a son, Cornelius, born in 1707. And Cornelius was the one who made this deposition. And the deposition is partly the court scribe paraphrasing his remarks and partly quoting him directly. So Cornelius Du Bois stated that two of his father's brothers were taken captive as children with their mother and that Cornelius often heard his father and his uncle Abraham talk about those times. And he understood from them, quote, that they remained captives among the Indians so long as that the boys talked Indian when they returned. You can just imagine the consternation of some of the residents uh, of, of Wiltwick, which included the refugees from the new village, of course, uh, hearing these little uh, Huguenot children speaking Indian amongst themselves. Um, but it, it speaks to the degree to which, again, they, they mixed and were incorporated in the life of the Indian village. And this is, I think, I've always felt the most exciting and the most important part of our historical and cultural heritage from those early times. This is this period of, um, of captivity and living with the Indians. Um, amongst those who had been taken captive and spent you know, months living with the Indians were members of the Schoonmaker, Brink, Rosa, Crispell, DeWitt, and Du Bois families, all obviously still well represented in Ulster County today. Well, to whatever extent Christopher Davis's life choices may have been motivated by a thirst for wilderness exploration and cross-cultural adventure, we may rest assured that this curiosity was satisfied by this exciting uh, expedition to the new fort of the Sopus Indians in early September of 1663. On February 12, 1667, Christopher Davids uh, registers a contract in which he sold to Everett Pels for 300 guilders his land situated on the bank of the kill near the Rondau to the east of the wagon road. This, is, this wording is from the Dutch language uh, court minutes of, um, of Wiltwick. Uh, uh, and um, his land situated on the bank of the, near the Rondau to the east of the wagon road, running till a running little kill and extending till the second hill or mountain in the interior of the country up to the Pankaking Path and with it his dwelling standing on the bank near the Rondau. Now, um, Everett Pels uh, buys the land from him and then leases it to an English soldier, Samuel Oliver. The terms of the lease indicate that the house was in need of some repairs, including the building of a support and a chimney. Now remember I said that it's a little bit suspect what Kit David said in that petition of uh, several years earlier about his house being burned by the savages. Well, if the, his house had been burned, then when he moved back there around 1664, he would have had to build a new house. And it seems a little unlikely that only three years later, the house would be in need of a, of a uh, support and a chimney. Uh, so maybe his house, uh, even though it obviously was commandeered by the uh, Indians, maybe it in fact not, had not been burned. Or maybe Kit Davis, when he came back, just built a kind of slipshod house, which, you know, was a little bit of a shanty. That probably wouldn't have been totally out of character either. Um, it's uncertain now. So Kit Davids sells his historic tract of land on the Rondau. It is uncertain where Davids and his family lived after this. They may have spent some time living within the fortified Esopus village of Wiltwick, perhaps as renters. But Davids also occupied some land just south of the Rondau which was referenced in the sale of an adjacent tract by Kit Davids in the fall of 1677, a tract which Kit had purchased from the Indians only two and a half years earlier. It is well documented that there was a great deal of tension and animosity 
between the mostly Dutch-speaking residents of Esopus, including those of English birth, like Tom Chambers and Kit Davids, and the English soldiers who arrived as an occupying force in the late summer of 1664, after the Indian War was over. Even Thomas Chambers was at one point accused of having slandered the English soldiers uh, by describing them as a party of bandits who had been banished from England and sent to some island and took their course to New Netherland without the authority of the King of England. Or in another version, that he had said that some English behave in such a manner, cursing and swearing and blustering as if they were bandits. Well, if Thomas Chambers could lose his temper and allegedly commit such an indiscretion, certainly could, Kit Davis could do no less. As a matter of fact, I think we'd all be disappointed in him if he hadn't uh, done something comparable. Um, on February 13th, 1669, uh, the Wiltwick Court heard the complaint of the soldier Edward Whitaker, who testified that Kit David said that I had his land, whereupon I answered, what should I do with your land? The governor general has given it to me. Thereupon Davids answered, the general is a fool for having given it to you, and all of you are nothing but beggars who have come over, and as soon as you put your foot upon the land to plow, it will cost you your life, and more other words pass. <clears throat> Thereupon, according to the testimony of Jan Janssen von Amersfoort, Whitaker drew his sword and hit Kit Davids in the shoulder. Whereupon Davids took a cane in which was embedded a sword blade and said, if I could, I would thrust you through the body, but I will not, and threw the same down. According to additional testimony, Jan the Brabanter picked up the sword and said to Whitaker, get out of my house, and pursued him into the street, whereupon Whitaker replied by throwing stones. These were grown men. These were grown <laughs> men doing this. Um, Kit Davids himself was not present in the courts at the court session, and no action seems to have been taken against Davids or Whitaker, possibly because both may have been judged equally at fault. Davids' name next appears um, in, um, on February 24, 1669, uh, in a letter from Governor Lovelace. Uh, the English governor uh, addressed to the magistrates at Esopus. In the letter, the governor suggests Davids's employment as an interpreter and witness to proposed proceedings of the Esopus and other Indians with the Mohawks and Senecas. Now, in this letter, making this recommendation, Governor Lovelace sort of qualifies his endorsement. What he writes is, <clears throat> if you are not provided better, I think Christopher Davis may be a fit person job, this role. <laughs> the following item is from the Kingston Court Minutes under date of March 20th, 1676. Hancrep, an Esopus savage, complains that Christopher Davids has taken the dragnet which he had left on the land and sold the same to Everett Pels and Frederick Hussey, requests restitution of his dragnet. Christopher Davids says the savage had caused the dragnet to be spoiled by the water and that the drag debt was no good anymore. The justice and sheriff order Christopher Davids to return the dragnet, and the purchasers are prohibited from keeping the dragnet because Christopher Davids has sold that which did not belong to him. When the Indians sold a large tract of land south of the Rondell Creek on December 13, 1682, they declared that they, quote, had permitted Christopher Davids to temporarily occupy said land, though not as proprietor. It seems likely that in this document they were referring to a deceased Christopher Davids. And in fact, he does not appear as a living person after in the, in the records after 1677. And so Kit Davids exits the documentary record, not with a dramatic flourish, but with a half-hearted attempt to justify his petty larceny of a fishing net from an Indian, and with an apparently posthumous reference to his residency as a temporary squatter on the opposite side of the Rondout Creek from his historic tract of nearly 30 years earlier. He departs with more of a whimper than a bang. Now, public records are by their nature selective and an imperfect vehicle for assessing an individual's essential nature. 
It's a shame, for example, that we have no idea of what Kit looked like, other than, that, other than that he was an Englishman by birth and presumably physically fit. Was he charismatic? Was he well-liked by his friends despite his proclivity for mischief? Was he a good husband and a tender father to his children despite his alleged poor management of their inheritance? Or was he an occasional drunk, an unabashed troublemaker, and more than a bit of a lowlife? Should we credit him with a modicum of cultural and intellectual curiosity and empathy regarding the Native Americans? Or was his relationship with them almost ex exclusively one of opportunism rather than genuine mutual respect and affection? Well, the answer to all these questions is perhaps. In the end, we are free to believe what we wish about Christopher Davis. Personally, my choice has always been to like him. You know, when I was a student at Ulster County Community College many, many years ago, the late professor Harry Matson once told, had, op, had uh, occasion to tell the class, and I have no recollection what the context was, but he said to the class, who would ever choose to go to heaven? What are you going to do there, float around on a pink cloud all day? In hell, at least you can play poker with the devil. Well, if I had a choice between an afternoon tea with the prosperous and respectable lord of Foxhole Manor, or an evening of drinking and storytelling with Davids, I have no doubt whose company I would find more fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. I was thinking the same thing. I don't know whether after that I want to meet Kit Davids for a beer or not. And I, I, I think I do. I think I do. So Mark, thank you so much. Do we have any questions for Mark? And yeah. this is a, truly a, a, a very rare opportunity uh, to ask who's the, probably the preeminent authority on the early Kingston, anything your heart desires yeah, it doesn't within reason. Kit Davids. Matter of preferably not, because I just told you everything I know. Uh, I think you were first, actually. We don't know precisely, uh, but it was, uh, you know, down there near the shore, uh, probably near where the fort was uh, was built. Uh, exactly, no. I think Brink mentions uh, that he thought the fort was located on the corner of Hone and Pierpont Street, or something like this. And I think some of those names have changed. You know, we could probably get it within a few hundred yards, but that's about it. Yes. Wagon road that's, uh, that you referenced. Yeah, yeah. What would have been using modern Kingston streets? What would have been the route, the oldest route that they would have taken? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look something up in my book because um, I was wondering about this myself, and I think this is under the place the guide to place names in referencing Pankaki, but if not, then I'm going to have to just paraphrase. Um, um, no, it's not here. Some it must be somewhere else. There is a map, I think it's from 1777, which shows a wagon road leaving the Strand and following, as I recall, it's, it, it's in the book here. Um, probably if I spent five or ten minutes searching the index, I could find it, which I obviously don't have time for now. Uh, uh, and it follows modern day Broadway pretty much as it heads up from the Roundout area and then curves right around the hill and then modern day, uh, and it continues to uptown Kingston. So that seems to be an ancient route uh, in use at least since, I think this map was 1777, and quite likely was the, you know, the, the footpath used. Uh, we can't be certain of it, of course. Anybody else? Yes, Ed. Yeah, 
Yes, I have. <laughs> you would, well, knowing you, yeah. Well, it's not just that. Um, first of all, um, there's no record of it ever being called the Old Mine Road until well into the 19th century. Um, the theory uh, was that it was a road built by Dutch miners prior to settlement here for taking uh, 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 mineral wealth out of the Shanga Mountains and out of the Kittatinny Mountains, uh, just the side of the Delaware Water Gap. Um, if you remember Crager's report of his expedition to the Old Fort, he was obviously following an Indian footpath, not a road. Uh, there is a whole host of problems with this theory. Um, and um, Donald McTiernan wrote a master's thesis about it, basically debunking it, and this is quite a few decades ago, debunking it uh, and showing, quoting documents uh, that showed that this road had basically been built by the Ulster County Board of Supervisors in sections <laughs> during the, uh, now, uh, initially the Indian footpath may have been extended as a very crude wagon road by the first settlers going out there, you know, as far as Wawarsing or, or so. Um, but uh, for the most part, this was built uh, under the jurisdiction of the board, uh, the, uh, the highway superintendents uh, of Ulster County during the period, you know, 1710 to 1720. Now, um, Herbert Kraft, who wrote a 600-odd page compendium about everything that is known about the Lenape Indians, he was a, uh, an archaeologist and anthropologist from... Uh, is he from Rutgers? No, from, uh, trying to think of the name of the university, in, in, in uh, New Jersey. Um, and he wrote a book about the old mine road uh, in which he goes much further and he, he uh, gives the evidence or lack of evidence in the context of Indian-Dutch relationships, uh, relations during this period, in the context of the economic straits of the Dutch West India Company, um, and he shows, you know, absolutely without a shadow of a doubt that there is no way this could have taken place during this time. The Indians were hostile. Uh, the Dutch West Indy Company did not have money to build a hundred mile road. Not only that, but he did archaeological digging at the site of the, uh, uh, of the uh, mine uh, at the, in the Kittatinny. Uh, the name of the mine again, you just mentioned it. Down in, in the kit, yeah, near the, what the name of the, uh, yeah, no, there's a name name to that mine which I, I just can't think of right now, um, and you know it came up with evidence first of all that the grade of ore there was very low, that uh, there may have been a little experimental mining, exploratory mining done in the 1700s, again far later than when this road was supposedly built and that uh, serious mining there was not even done until the early 1800s, and you know, the company lost money. So there's just, you know, uh, absolutely, you know, this is a case along with the 1614 supposed fort at the mouth of Rondat, where someone makes a statement early, a lot of, you know, amateur star antiquarians from the late 19th century jump on this because it's sort of very exciting, you know, and, and it's repeated and repeated, and um, the you know modern scholarship you know just completely removes it as a possibility. There's no reason to believe that that was a mine road built to extract mines, uh, or that there was a fort at the mouth of Rand at the Randat Creek in 1614. The only reason to believe it is because it's fun to believe it, but uh, no other reason. Yes. Uh, you mentioned a couple of vessels for brandy. One of them was an anchor. Yes. Yeah. Okay, an anchor, yeah, an anchor is 10 gallons. Ten gallons. Yeah. Now, mutskin is, uh, is a word uh, I mentioned once, uh, you know, in the quote. I, do, I have not come across that word except in that quote, and as a matter of fact, the translator gives it in Dutch instead of translating it. Uh, does anybody, do you have any idea what a mutskin is? You know, I don't know either. But an anchor was 10 gallons, um, and that's used frequently. As a matter of fact, it was a sign of manhood back in those days, 
if you could hoist a ten, uh, if you could hoist an anchor jug uh, or barrel of, of brandy onto your shoulder and drink out of the bunghole, that that meant you. <laughs> and who knows, but Kit Davids may have accomplished that. <laughs> yes. No, no. Uh, most of these people, we don't really know where they were buried. Thomas Chambers was an exception. You know, he had money. You know, he could afford a real gravestone. But no, I don't know. Any other questions? I have one. Yes. Are there, where the location of the two forts that were no. destroyed, no. are there <clears throat> current markers, or, or what would be the current locations Today and where they are. Okay. Um, yeah, there is a, I think, a state historical marker along Route 209 in Wawarsing, which says it refers it, to it as the Council House of the of the uh, of the Indians, and I'm not sure whether it mentions, uh, you know, that it was destroyed, the old fort, you know, destroyed in 1663. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, but that fort, uh, that Indian village uh, and and fort, would have been at the if you're going downstream on the Benoit Creek, the tributary of the Rondat, it would be on your left side. If you're going downstream on the Rondat, it would also be on your left side. So it was more or less the north corner of the confluence of those two streams, but the north corner would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, agricultural fields, but up on the hill, which is still known as Indian Hill. Is um, there a current what would we drive by if you drive by? Uh, the best way to see it would be to turn left on Port Bend Road off of 209, and then just before the bridge across the Rondout, look across the fields to the left uh, at a wooded hill a few hundred yards distant, and it would be up on there. Now, the new fort in Shangam, there is a historical marker, uh, and for this you would go onto Hogberg Road, which runs approximately northeast southwest. Uh, and then perpendicular to that is a dead end road called Old Fort Road, uh, which is a continuation of Bates Lane. Uh, anyway, uh, Old Fort Road goes northwestward toward the mountain from Hogberg Road, and it ends at the Blaustein Farm. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a house was built precisely, and I think by design, uh, right on the site that tradition says was the actual site of the fort. Uh, and just below which on the bank was a, is a spring. Uh, so that helps kind of, you know, locate it as, uh, and uh, unfortunately archeological work has not turned up contact period stuff because the dig done by Lynn Eisenberg was done a few hundred yards from there. He was interested in the more ancient Indian stuff, not the contact period stuff. And uh, Joe Diamond, uh, was going to do a dig there. It got permission from the landowner, who's a bit of a uh, property rights uh, uh, fanatic. Uh, but Joe couldn't do it that year. He'd already made commitments. And by the next year, the landowner said, nothing doing, you're not going here. And then he had the house built there, I think his daughter or something like that. Uh, I think partly just to discourage any more anthropologists from digging around on his land. Um, if not, anything else? If not, uh, any other questions? Yeah. No. You already know everything. Great. Mark, thank you. That was that was that was very interesting. And Kit Davids really is, I think, without question, he's the most interesting of the early settlers. Uh, Mark also has a number of his books, including the Kingston book uh, and, uh, and some of the others. So he has them up here if you would like to, uh, to come up and, and, and purchase one. Uh, if you have not read the Kingston book particularly, you need to. You really need to. The two main books on Kingston history are Mark's book on the history of Kingston and Mary Schoonmaker's history of Kingston. They're really the two pr primary books. Um, <coughs> So if you haven't, you really need to. So please come up and, and, and do that. And I just want to tell a, a funny story. Besides from all Mark's knowledge, which is uh, unbelievably impressive and unbelievably valuable, he has another very rare and special gift. He is actually ageless. If you've seen, and I, you probably have, I, I didn't know Mark. I'd never seen Mark. But there's a picture on the back of his book. And I've read this so many times that I'm very familiar with it. In uh, this year, 
St. Patrick's Day. Uh, my wife is from Wauquill, not very far from where Mark lives. We went to the St. Patrick's Day parade. After that, we went to Elsie's bar for a uh, corned beef sandwich, and I walk in, and I see Mark. And I said, that's, that's Mark Free. That's got to be Mark Free. He looks exactly like he does then. <laughs> I went up to him, and he was as gracious as could be. He, talked, he took the time to talk to me for a while. So uh, it is, that's a very special gift. And we again thank, we thank Mark. We thank all of our speakers. Uh, we are so fortunate here that we have the people who are as talented and as gifted and as dedicated to our local history as we have. But we are also doubly blessed that they're so willing to share. Every single presenter we've had, I've called them up out of the blue. And they all, there's no question of uh, no or giving me a hard time. The first thing they say is, oh, absolutely, sure, I'll do it. So we really have a special group. Uh, and Mark is certainly, he, he, he had never heard of me. Didn't know anything about me. I asked him. I told him we have a lecture series. We, we wondered if he could do it. He said, oh, absolutely, sure. So we really are, are blessed to have all of our historians. And Mark, thank you so much for that presentation. I also want to recognize Ted Dietz. I don't think Ted Dietz gets the credit that he deserves uh, with regard to early, the history of early Kingston. Uh, you know, Mark really laid the foundation. Ted has, has taken that and, and built on it with his books. They're absolutely wonderful, going back to individual personality profiles of the early settlers. Uh, so I do want to recognize Ted's, uh, Ted's contribution. I don't think he, he gets the credit that he deserves, so I do want to do that. We want to, again, thank uh, uh, Tom and Jacob, uh, Eileen, Christine, everybody from the Senate House. Again, they keep this open for us. They allow us to come in here. And again, I ask everybody, be careful when you're getting up around the, the pictures. Uh, Tom asked me, he's, you know, this is a you broke it, you bought it situation. But now he, he told me today that if, if you don't buy it, then I have to buy it. So please, everyone, be careful. Uh, we, and we want to really thank them for what they do. Bob Rizzo, again, who films all these, if you want a copy, please see him. They are exceptional. They are absolutely exceptional. All the people who provide the publicity, Hugh Reynolds, uh, who's always here, uh, Jillian Fisher, Friends of Historic Kingston, Ulster County Tourism, Kingston Community Radio, Kingston Happenings, Daily Freeman Preview, Walt Wachowski and the Civil War, War Civil War Roundtable, all of these people try and, and spread the news. And they all do this out of their love of history, and we thank them for that. Again, Kingston's buried treasures. But you couldn't ask for a nicer group. You have Joe Tantillo. Joe, again, he's the one who, who makes this from a ship shot uh, operation to something sleek and, and beautiful. So Joe, thank you. Ed, again, what can you say about Ed? Uh, he's the... He's the end-all, be-all. Um, Nina, Nina Postupak, our county clerk. Uh, Tom Hafe, our, our common council majority leader. Uh, Ann Gordon, the, uh, our Ulster County historian. Both of them are involved in the unveiling tomorrow afternoon of the Sojourner Truth uh, statue. So please, it's going to be 2 o'clock in Esopus uh, at the Sojourner Truth Park, which is right where the Sopus Town Hall was. The unveiling is going to be uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Uh, it's been a long time coming, so it's going to be a great event. Please come there if you can. Pat Murphy. Um, Pat is actually the one who came up with the title Kingston's Buried Treasures. You can't get a better one. So uh, I also want to recognize Jake K. Wine and Liquor. They provided the wine today. Um, they, I went down and asked them, hey, would you be willing to sponsor us with a, a bottle of wine once a month. And they said, well, what's the lecture series about? I told them it's about promoting Kingston, Kingston history. And they said, absolutely. That's great. We'd love to participate. So we'd like to thank them um, and all of you. Again, without you, we wouldn't be here. So we thank you. And again, please take advantage of, um, of Mark. He's, again, he has a few of his books. I'll tell you, they are all exceptional. So feel free to come on up. OK, thank you. Oh. Before we leave, I'm sorry, I want to just tell you what we have upcoming. Octo next month, October 18th, 
We have uh, Bob Studing is going to be doing a presentation on round out the boom years, really part two of Kingston and the round out. And uh, Bob Studing uh, wrote the book Round Out, a Hutchin River Port. If you haven't read it, again, it is also a must read about down in the strand and round out during the boom years of the D&H Canal when it was really a, a wild west place. Um, on November, in November, November 15th, we have Arthur Fleming presented by our assemblyman, Kevin Cahill. Arthur Fleming was somebody that I had not heard of. Arthur Fleming was uh, very influential in our national politics. In fact, he was United States Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare under uh, President Dwight Eisenhower. And he is also the one who is responsible for the Cranberry Scare of 1959. Does anybody know what that is? I, I had heard of that many times, and it pops up time and time again. He, there had been a, uh, I guess, a batch of cranberries right before Thanksgiving that had potentially been uh, affected by a pesticide. He said, don't buy them. It created a huge problem for the cranberry industry. It ended up being really unjustified. Um, <laughs> you hear it pop up now when somebody the government or somebody says you shouldn't buy something, and occasionally pop up saying this is just another cranberry scare. What it did, however, it led the cranberry industry to start looking for something besides relying on once a year cranberry and cranberry sauce, and really led to the cranberry juice becoming what it is. So he's a Kingstonian. All right, so again, thank Mark, thank you so much. Thank all of you. Hopefully, we'll see you next month. Mark, thank you.